Hey everybody, and welcome to Coffee Code Create, where we drink copious amounts of coffee. And we try to write code that doesn't suck. Now, today I have my classic NASA failure is not an option mug. And I thought that was particularly applicable today because I was faced with a project that I kind of thought was a failure and I was just ready to be done with it. So I'm sure you've gone through the same thing where you've just started out a project or a game or whatever it is you're working on. Everything's going great. You're just knocking out feature after feature. And then after a while, you look at your code and you just realize it's a steaming pile of <laughs> And well, that happened to yours truly. So the project that I'm talking about here is the SimCity clone that I'm creating in JavaScript. So some of you might be familiar with those videos. I've created a playlist where I've tried to make a tutorial to show you how you can go about creating a city simulator like SimCity in JavaScript. Now, I came into the project without really planning anything. It was kind of my first set of YouTube videos and that really bit me in the butt because after a while, the thing was just a train wreck. The first few videos went fine, but after a while, each time I would create a new video, add a new feature, I'd be rewriting so much code that it was almost impossible to follow along with. So eventually it got so bad that I decided just to abandon the project entirely and focus on other things like the Minecraft clone in JavaScript and the procedural planet generator. However, a lot of people have been asking me to create more videos in that series, so I decided to put on the rubber gloves and get to work cleaning up that mess. So if we take a step back, let's think about what a city simulator is. So really, it's just a bunch of little simple behaviors that all kind of merge together to create this complex simulation with emergent behavior. And that's what makes city simulators so interesting and fun to play. So I began implementing a few of these behaviors when working on my city simulator. And I didn't really think too much about how to like split up that code or how to organize it. I all kind of just put it in the same file. And after a while, it just became kind of a spaghetti mess. I didn't know what variable was used for what particular feature. There's these just dependencies that were hard to keep track of. And it really just became really hard to follow. So I actually ended up coming with a really simple solution for this that's gonna make developing features much, much easier. So before we get into how I reorganized my code, I wanted to touch on another issue that I was trying to address with my city simulator. And that was the visuals of the city were completely separated from the underlying data model that drove those visuals. So I initially did this because it was considered good programming practice to have a separation of concerns. Yeah. Really, it just made my code trash and way harder to work with. And one of the reasons that it made things more difficult was because related logic that should have been together in the same file was split across multiple files. There was also a discontinuity between my city data model and the visuals that you saw on the screen. So anytime that there's any change to the city, I would have to go through and scan every tile, every building, and determine if there are any changes made. If there were, then I'd make those updates to the scene. And that was just kind of a slow and efficient process. And I thought it made a lot more sense if the objects themselves were responsible for updating their view, updating their model, their textures, whatever. And the third and final point is I'm not actually trying to recreate SimCity in its an entirety here. It'd be way too complex of a project and take years. I'm trying to create kind of a, a good faith clone that has some of the fun behaviors. So sometimes over architecting things can just make a project harder to work on. Um, it's easier just to write some simpler code that's easier to work with so you can stick with a project. So going back to my first issue of code organization, my idea was to come up with this concept of modules. To start with, I've defined this base class called SimModule. Now every module that I create inherits from that class and it just gives me kind of a blueprint that I can work with. So just looking at a very simple example of a module here, we're going to be looking at road access. So each tile either has access to a road or it doesn't. What is all in this module? So we have a value here. So this is whether or not that tile has access to a road. And then we instantiate this with a reference to a tile. So each tile on the city map is going to have its own little road access module. And that's just going to keep track of that value for each tile. So going down to the simulate function, each time we're updating the state of our city, we're moving it forward one day at a time we're gonna be calling this function. 
So the logic here is very simple. All we're doing is picking this tile as a starting point and we're finding any tile in the city that is of type road that is within the allowed search distance. So if we do find a road, then we'll set the value to true, meaning that this tile has road access. Now you can see I have other modules here for zone development, for jobs, for residents. So let's just click on development really quickly. So you can see I have my different development states. A zone could be abandoned, developed, under construction, undeveloped. And then if we just scroll down to the simulate function here, you can see that I have all the logic for determining when a zone should be developed, when a zone should become abandoned. So previously all of that was defined on the zone itself, which is okay, but as I've been adding more and more features in, the code is getting more and more complicated and it's getting really hard to tell where things are. So I'm really liking this new approach of the modules. It allows me to just add independent blocks of code and not have to worry about screwing up other code that I've written. Now the final dragon I had to slay with this code rewrite is unifying the visuals of my city with the data model. So previously I had things split nicely between my city class, which handled all the simulation logic and the scene manager, which would take in a city and it would generate a 3D representation from that. So I've completely gotten rid of the scene manager and now each object in my city now handles updating its own visuals. So to help with this, I created a base class called sim object, which extends the, the 3JS object 3D. And this really just represents any kind of 3D object that you want to represent in the scene. So to show you how this all kind of fits together, I'm going to look at one example here. We're going to look at the zone class. So this is the zone class before I rewrote everything. So you can see that a lot of the development logic is defined directly on the zone itself. So is the building abandoned or not? Is it developed? Does it have road access? The, the development level, how long we have to wait until the building's abandoned, all that stuff is now abstracted away into the development module or the road access module. And if we look at the simulation logic, this used to be called step, now it's called simulate. All the development logic is defined on the zone itself here. And you know this isn't too bad, but if I go and add other things in, other logic for the zone, this is gonna become a mess. So I'm glad I got rid of this. Now let's look at the new file after the code rewrite. So all those variables that were related to development and abandonment and all that, that's all gone now. That's all now contained in the development module. So you can see I'm just creating a new property and creating a new instance of that module. And then I can easily access all of those properties related to development um, by just accessing it through this module. Now, in terms of getting the 3D representation out of the asset manager and into this class, we've now implemented this update mesh function. So anytime there's some big updates to a zone, it's going to call this function. And if you look at the simulate function for the zone, look at this. It's only two lines long. We're just calling the simulate on the super class, which is the building. And then we're just calling simulate on our development module. So this keeps things super clean and really easy to work with, and I'm really excited now to add more features to this game. So originally I had planned to do power plants for this video, but as you see, I had a lot of cleanup to do before I could tackle that. So I do plan on releasing power plants as the next video in the series. That'll be in about two or three weeks, depending on how much time I have with work and things like that. So if you'd like to vote on what features I work on next in this series or really any of my other videos, be sure to check out my Patreon. So for the price of a coffee per month, you can support my channel and all of your support is greatly appreciated. Um, I'm doing all this for free, so it really encourages me to keep making these videos. And I also want to make videos that you guys like, so it helps me know what you want to see next. So if you do decide to sign up, you'll actually get some perks with that. You'll be able to vote on upcoming videos. You'll get early access to videos. So you'll get it a few days earlier than everyone else. And there's actually a members-only Discord channel. So if you're not quite ready to commit yet, no problem at all, but I still encourage you to check out the Discord. That's completely free and that's a good place to go and ask questions if you're kind of following along with the series or just want to chat about 3JS and building cool things in 3JS. So you can find links for both Patreon and Discord in the description below. So that's all I had for this video. Until next time, thanks for watching and take care everyone.